This program is made possible by the loyal financial support of the friends and partners of Family Policy Institute. Good evening and welcome to Watchmen on the Wall. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're going to talk on the topic of prostitution. There are many organizations in South Africa pushing for a decriminalized sex industry. And many South Africans don't exactly know what that means. My guest in the studio is Salome and Chantel. And Salome comes from an organization called PACT. And what does that PACT mean? PACT stands for People Against Child Trafficking. Okay. So Salome... You, where do you stand on decriminalize, um, a decriminalized sex industry? What is your position on that? I'm definitely against it. And I think part of it is definitely because I saw so many little children as well who needed to sell themselves into the sex market. Yeah, I think that's a very important point you're making because when these organizations mm. um, talk about the alleged benefits of a decriminalized sex industry, the one thing that they do not mention is the children in the sex trade. So there's a lot of adult prostitutions, but there are a lot of children as well. And you've seen that. So tell us some of the stories. I mean, the other day we went out to the streets and we saw um, quite a lot of women in prostitution. And amongst those women, there was a girl and we assumed that she was around 12 years old, very small still. And she told us how she was brought down from Kimberley into the streets of Cape Town. And while we were talking to her, she was grabbed and she was taken away from a gangster. Now, would you, would you um, call that trafficking? Definitely. I mean, she was not there by her own will. And you could see that out of outside forces we were taking her as way, away as soon as we started chatting with her. Yeah, what is happening in the media also, there's this romantic version of prostitution. And in order for the organizations that's pushing a decriminalized sex industry, they have to romanticize it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to tell you all the gory details of what <laughs> actually happens in the sex industry, the exploitation, the abuse of women and children. Yeah. The fact that most of the prostitutes on the streets mm -hmm. are controlled by pimps, gangs, right. organized crime, brothel owners. And if we decriminalize the entire sex industry, that means all of these people become legitimate businessmen. All of them. The brothel, brothels will become legitimate businesses. Uh, pimps will become businessmen. In fact, they'd be able to open a brothel next to a church if they want to do, mm. because it's, it's like in any other business. So people haven't thought this through. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that have disturbed you that you've seen, because our viewers need to understand the horrors of what happen, actually happens yeah. in this industry. So some weeks ago, we went up to Beaufort West to the truck stop, and it was 9.30 in the evening, and we saw a 10-year-old girl standing there in the dark. And I asked her, what are you doing here? And she pointed at the truck, and she said, my mom is searching for love in the truck. And then I looked at this little child, and I said, do you have to go sometimes as well? And she said, yeah, sometimes I have to work as well. And she's 10 years old. She's 10 years old. Now, you see, Salome, these are not the stories we hear and see mm. in our mainstream media. Mm. Yeah. And that's why so many people are believing that if you decriminalize the sex industry, you're actually helping the woman. Mm. And what you see, see on the streets mm. actually see tells you no ways. Yeah. This cannot happen. Yeah. Okay, I want to bring you in, Chantal. You are studying sexology. That's the first time I've heard this, but sexology <laughs> is something that you can study. But you were talking about sexology and how pornography and the fact that pornography is so easily available to just about anybody, children as well, and how this has a connection to demeaning and degrading women and the eventual abuse and exploitation of women and children. Yes. Well, the effect that pornography has, as if you're watching a movie, that you get emotionally engaged in the movie and you react emotionally, pornography has a similar effect on the brain. And your emotions would, would um, create a feeling that you're actually 
in the reality of the pornography. So when it comes to acting out, it comes, it creates a monster within you. It creates this appetite, this unnatural sexual appetite that obviously prostitutes would bear the brunt of, which is often violent. So as the pornography addiction increases, your appetite for the pornography increases with it. So normal porn wouldn't be cool anymore. And so we're seeing an increase in child porn. And this is an issue that PACT is concerned about because now we are putting our children at risk and children that are prostituted are also enacting what the pornography has created. That's right. Now, Chantal, in your studies, do you see uh, or is there evidence that the high rates of sexual abuse of women and children is happening because so many people are addicted to pornography and they're desensitized against the kind of abuse we see. Yes, absolutely. So as I said earlier, so in the mind, it's a reality. So when you do it, say if a person wakes up on a random Thursday, chooses to have sex with an eight-year-old child, they will have no physiological changes because in their mind, accessing pornography, they've already been there. And that is, is a... An issue. Mm. Salome, uh, you know, the argument is made by, by SWEAT and other organizations that if you decriminalize the entire sex industry, mm -hmm. you're going to help protect the dignity and the humanity of the woman in yeah. prostitution. Because this is a fact. A lot of these prostitutes on the street are being abused by police officials. Yeah. They're being abused, they're being raped, their money's been taken from them, and yeah. of course they cannot go to the police and lay a complaint because they are in an illegal industry. So if you decriminalize the entire industry, is it going to help the woman? I don't believe so. We, even in that story which I told you before about a 12-year-old girl, the police actually drove by and saw this woman and they just went off. So I definitely think that it would give them even more freedom to just sell their own kids or for the guys who take the kids away to exploit them to have a bigger freedom in that. Mm. Do you believe that if a, the sex industry is decriminalized that it would um, draw more women and children into prostitution? Um, I don't, don't think at all children because I cannot see a child waking up in the morning and saying I want to sell myself, I want to have sex. I think there needs to be a lot of other things happening before a child is even getting that mindset. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think so. The reason I asked that question is the research we looked at at uh, the Netherlands mm -hmm. and parts of Australia and Germany, mm -hmm. we have all decriminalized the sex industry. Mm -hmm. Whenever that has happened for adult prostitution, mm -hmm. child prostitution increased. Mm -hmm. I think so, so too. So, so the arguments that, that SWEAT and other organizations is making that, you know, if we decriminalize the sex industry, we're protecting the women. Yeah. But the evidence is showing when you do that, child prostitution increases, and they're not talking about that aspect of it. Yeah. And your uh, experience in both ways with a 10-year-old girl mm. uh, just helps us understand because there's so many young children um, uh, on the street. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about uh, prostitution and the huge push to decriminalize the sex industry in South Africa. Now, the Law Reform Commission of South Africa is going to be releasing their seven-year study on prostitution law reform. But before they even do that, there are organizations mm -hmm. making arguments that if we decriminalize the entire sex industry in South Africa, that this is going to help protect uh, the humanity, the dignity, and the human rights of women in South Africa in, that are trapped in prostitution. So my guest is Madre Breve from Stradvek. Now Stradvek is an organization that reaches out to women in prostitution, working on the streets, as their name suggests, um, understanding where the women are coming from and um, reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. Madre, welcome to the Watchman on the Wall studio and thank you for joining us. Firstly, I want to commend you for the excellent work that you do. You've heard my intro. What is your view on a decriminalized sex industry in South Africa? Yeah, Errol, we strongly believe that um, it wouldn't be good that um, the women are exposed to such legalization um, or decriminalization, actually. Um, you know, the, the ladies that we meet on the street are beautiful people with so much potential. And nearly all of them don't want to be there. 
And we really believe that it won't be a gift to them to make um, it or to decriminalize it, to take all legalization or any laws against it away. But from the point that we say the ladies have to be helped, um, they have to be helped to live a full life, to live an abundant life as everybody is supposed to be. And um, just from that angle that um, if we then say that the most vulnerable or mostly the vulnerable are exposed to prostitution, at the same time, we know that the ladies don't want to be there. So to say that we're doing a favor to those that don't want to do it, to be able to do it, um, really um, doesn't make that much sense. But, but this is the argument that Sweat and other organizations make. They, the gist of their argument, the reason you need to decriminalize the sex industry is because these women need help. They're being raped, they're being abused, you know, uh, they, uh, they can't go to uh, the police and lay charges when they are abused and their money is stolen. Um, they cannot go for health checks and all these kind of things. I don't know how, you know, they make that argument, but they are making the argument and say, the reason we need to decriminalize so that we can help the woman. And so they focus on helping the woman, but you working with the woman on the streets. What are they saying? Errol, they're saying they don't want to be there and they say they want to be helped. And obviously they need to be ready to be helped and it's a long journey um, in their healing and restoration. But let's go a, a little bit further back to say, yes, the ladies are violated and used and abused on the street in prostitution. But most of them, even before entering, they have been used and abused. Sometimes not for money, but for other things. And usually against their will. So they've been sexually traumatized ahead of time. So you actually have a hurting woman who's making some decisions, trying to survive, and then she's being hurt more. And we say, well, if we really want to help, then help the person to become what she's supposed to be, a free woman doing what she's designed to do and not doing something that's just being more abused and more brokenness and more hurt on what she's already experienced in her life up to that point. So would you argue then we should keep the status quo? We should keep the entire sex industry as it is criminalized, but with exit programs? Yeah, that, you know, if, if a lady um, has that option, then it changes something in her when she realizes she can exit because then it is her right to make that decision. And I think from the other angle, people want to say, well, let's give her the opportunity to say yes to then doing prostitution. But even the definition of slavery says it's involuntary submission. So they don't really want to do that. What they want is to survive. What they want is to be able to look after their children. They're good mothers. They, they want to love their children in, in the right ways and provide for them or whatever the reason is. So that's what they want. They don't want to be sexually used by men that they don't know. So let them say yes to what they actually look for instead of having them say yes to something that they feel is the only means they have. And that is abuse again. So if somebody is being raped against their, what well, we say then it's against their will. Yes, that's extremely sad. I cannot even imagine that. But at the same time, we say if somebody says yes to rape, which prostitution actually is, and a lot of the ladies will tell you that. How sad is that? Somebody gives permission to it. So we say, no, we want to help them. Um, and that is the call for the whole country. We need to come alongside people that are hurt and broken and seeking and find the way that there is. And I believe the church has a huge role to play. Everything they need is inside of the church. Now, a lot of these women are in prostitution, not by choice. You speak to a lot of them. You're ministering to women on a daily basis on the streets. H how do women get into prostitution? Yeah. Let's take um, the scenario we, we've talked about where a lady's been sexually abused, which is true about a lot of them. Um, so she learns that she's an object. So she's objectified. And she learns that from very young. She doesn't receive anything for that. Um, and she's very broken. At the stage where she's at the place where she has to find a way of earning money or, you know, going forward and and prostitution looks like an option, it's, it's not really a big step. It's just, it's been done to me without any payment, without any benefit. Now I'm choosing to do it out of my hurt and brokenness, but I'm choosing to do it and now I get something for it. Mm. Um, so, so it's just very sad that that's often um, a big part of the journey. I'm thinking of one of our friends, you know, so used and abused, eventually ends up in a situation, the guy brings the, you know, the next morning, the food on the tray, the money in the drawer, Compared to what she had, she thinks that's life. We're saying, no, there's more to life. And then you often get where 
or in some situations where a lady just um, she comes from a different country or say the father of the children leaves her and she's in a desperate situation usually also if they experience some sexual traumatized events and then make that decision so um, yes at some stage somebody is saying yes and they're making a decision they have to own that but it is in this this whole journey of brokenness mm. that they make it not we sometimes say how can they do that well how can they because they're so and broken that's how they can um so you're working on the streets with this woman tell us some of the successes that you have seen reaching this woman with the gospel of jesus christ are many of them responding to the message yeah it's a it's a long journey era we've um, recently just a lady that um, we have the privilege of journeying with her. She was on the street for a, a month, which is a month too long, but it's a month. And then you have ladies who've been in there for so many years. Like, I mean, it could be a few decades. You know, when I was at like 19, the lady would have been like 17. And, you know, now she's eventually standing. And I mean, the Lord had many interventions in, in her life in the meantime. But I wish you could see these women, like we started out saying they're beautiful people. They have so much potential. So what you see is this person who exits now on the one end, she's for the first time feeling all her hurts because it's like somebody who's been numbed and wounded. Yeah. Now the feeling is coming back. So that is such a journey for them. And it's, a, yeah, it's, it's amazing how they journey on that. And then to see how they develop. You know, how they start blooming and they find their own potential, their dignity. They understand who they are in the Lord, that they're not only there to receive, but to give. And they're wonderful givers. So um, in each um, individual situation, the, the, um, the principle stays the same. Love and truth restores people that comes from the Lord and from His people. So relationships are key. But how they develop and what is needed is so unique. And that's wonderful through all the years to see how the Lord meets a person, a lady usually where she's at, or a guy that exited, and then help them find their full potential. So, Madre, when we talk about exit programs, obviously we need facilities in place to receive these people. And are you finding that there are enough safe houses and Christian organizations that are there to help these people and transform them and walk them through the process? Errol, there were, I believe there's so many ladies who's going to exit that more is needed. So I want to, please, anybody who has this on your heart, start it, open it, keep it, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. With that, we have to say, the true home that these ladies need are relationships with the Lord and with His people. So it's one thing to have a bed for somebody to sleep in in a house or a place to stay in. That is important. That's why I say, please do that. But the people who have to love them back to life, that is what is most needed. That's and right. that comes from hearts who understand that this woman is valuable. And then we have to stay on the journey with her and not think that she's just going to, you know, she's going to have some facility that's going to heal her. Yeah. The, the success is in the, in the um, relationship. So we need the commitment because it's a long term journey and we must be uh, prepared to walk that journey with them because there is success at the end of the road. So Madre Privet from Stadweg, thank you so much for the work you do, reaching these women with the gospel of Jesus Christ and for coming in and talking to us and explaining all the issues that you face on a daily basis. God bless you. Thank you, and we're the privileged people being able to do it. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome back to the program. I'm speaking to Aisha and Bronwyn, who are from Victory Outreach, an incredible ministry based in Cape Town that is working to get dr uh, drug dealers, uh, gangsters and prostitutes off the street. Now, Aisha, I want to start with you. You were a pimp on the streets. You used to pimp women in prostitution, yeah. and, uh, but God has saved you and transformed your life, and which is a wonderful testimony. We want to ask you about the sex industry, how the exploitation, what you've seen on the streets. Is that um, the women are always, they, they're broken, they're looking for a way, a way out, you know, and to, 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 to feed themselves, they, they sleep with men. You know, I, I did underage women, women that was 13, 14 years old, you know. Is there, is there a lot of that? Is a lot of child prostitution going around? There is a lot because of the, 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 the drug abuse of the women, you know, the, because they start at a young age already smoking drugs and to, to feed their habit, you know, they've been used a lot. So they, in their mindset, they will just go into prostitution and just, you know, sleep okay, with so, them. so women get hooked onto drugs 
through the gangs and the syndicates yes. that control them. Yeah. And then they have to begin to prostitute themselves to maintain the habit, the habit. to get the, the drugs. Yeah, yeah. So, so would you say then that drug dealing and drug addiction goes hand in hand with the sex industry? Oh, oh yes. They, they connect it. they like one. they like one, yeah. So in a decriminalized situation, if we decriminalize the entire sex industry in South Africa, as some organizations are suggesting, do you think things will get better for women? We'll be able to protect their human rights and their dignity? No, I think it will become worse. Because of, you know, sometimes women go into the thing not knowing that eventually they're going to be owned, you know, because they're thinking, okay, they're just going to do it for a little while, support the habits, whatever. But when they come into it, like for me, I had to, they, I owned the girls. They worked eventually for me, and basically they just worked for the usage and towards me, you know, and... And I kept them there. For and, and, and most of the women on the street and the children, because there's a lot of children on the streets yeah. in the sex industry that organizations like Sweat and others are not talking about because yeah. they don't want the public out there to know that there's so many children in it. But, you know, if, if women and children, um, you know, are decriminalized, or the sex industry de decriminalized, um, will the, the, the link and the hold of the sex uh, uh, crime syndicates and the uh, brothel owners and the pimps, will that be broken? Uh, because, you know, most of them are controlled by either a pimp, a gang or a crime syndicate. Yeah, no, but, uh, yeah, it will be way worse because, you know, most of the prostitutes or, or the women or the, you know, even young children have kids because of prostitution. They leave the kids by their mother so they never get to see their children. You know, the children is never with them. They leave the children for years, you know, because they know what they need to work for. They're working for their pumps and they're working for the usage and whatever they need, um, I will provide. Okay, Aisha, how long have you been a pump controlling um, the, you know, part of the sex industry? Since the age of 16, 16, 17. And how long? How many years were you How many doing years? That? I was for 23 years I've been on drugs because I started at the age of seven. You know, so I've been smoking majority of my life. So for, say, seven to eight years, I've been, I used to pump women. And how did you get saved? How did you come to know the Lord? Um, I was broken. I was lost. Um, I was a born Muslim. And my household was, you know, I was in drug addiction. My parents were druggies. I used to smoke with them you know, from the age of 14. So I had to find my own way on the streets. And um, when, I, when I turned 27, I met a pastor in Ocean View that was reaching out to, to, to broken women, that was reaching out to change the drug addiction. And he got me into Victory Outreach, you know, and I came into Victory Outreach. And to be honest, it was the love of God in Victory Outreach. You know, not just at the altars or in the sanctuary, but through his people that kept me there. Amen. And that's what the Bible actually says. It says it's the love of God that brings people to repentance. Mm -hmm. It's not shouting at people or making people feel bad. It's the love of God, and it will always be the love of God that brings people to repentance. That's why we serve the Lord with all our heart, because we love the Lord, because mm -hmm. He first loved mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Now, Bronwyn, I want to call, get, um, introduce you um, and talk about your background. You were a homosexual prostitute on the streets, uh, how long did you do that for? Uh, for 18 years. Old. For 18 years. Yeah. And again, through the love of God, God has saved you, redeemed you, Amen. transformed your life. Amen. And you're now serving the Lord and the purposes of God. But Amen. you give us your, your testimony of what happened on the streets. What did you see while doing what you were doing? Okay, for 18 years of my um, life, I've been obviously um, involved in prostitution. You know, I've been um, working with a syndicate, um, you know, um, um, foreigners, basically, to be honest. Crime syndicate. Yeah, yeah crime syndicate. Foreign crime syndicate. syndicate yeah. Uh, um, I've been controlled by them, you know. Um, I, uh, I was addicted to this drug called crack cocaine. And to support this drug called the crack cocaine, it's very expensive, you know, and he will do anything to support this drug. So uh, I, 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 I went to the extreme to support my drug habit, you know, and also not only support my drug habit, but because I was controlled by the drug, um, by the pump, basically, you know, you can say he's a pump. Um, I, I, I will, I will, I will, I will 
what what I will do is I will I will I will go out even though I am not feeling good. You know, I will go out even though I'm sick. I will go out even though it's cold or raining outside. Do you find that with all prostitutes that um, that's what happens? It doesn't matter what they feel like if they're sick, whatever. The pimps and the syndicates force you to go out because they want the money. Um, yes, um, um, ninety percent of, of 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 the cases it is. Don, um, tell me something. Do you think any of this will change if you decriminalize, make everything legal? Will anything improve for the women, for men, for children in prostitution? I don't think so, you know, um, because uh, there's not only the, 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 the improvement of the legalizing, what about, uh, you know, you get um, things that comes with the prostitution, you know, there's um, HIV, you know, there is, um, sick, you know, there's all these different yes. diseases as well, you know, and... Um, and how are you going to contain that? And how we exactly, um, so, so... You know what? Um, Bronwyn and Aisha, I want to thank you for your courage for coming in and talking about this. It's, it's very helpful to a lot of people out there because, uh, um, you know, we need to hear from people that have been on the streets. There's a lot of people saying, you know, if you decriminalize the sex industry, it's going to help this one, it's helped this, uh, that one, but they don't have um, the truth about what happens, the abuse and the exploitation of women, children and men in this terrible industry. So we want to thank you for talking to us. God bless you in your ministry. We, we, we pray that you go from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank you.